There's really not a lot of history behind this one. Basically, there were no other Ian Fleming novels to draw from, so this one was done purely based off of the success of Goldeneye. It came out two years later with Pierce Brosnan again donning the role of 007. So with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, Bond 18. Bond gets sent in to spy on an arms bazaar in Russia. MI6 gets a little trigger happy, jumping the gun and firing a missile on the bazaar, while James is still doing his reconnaissance. James hijacks a jet to escape the incoming missile and starts to pursue techno-terrorist Henry Gupta, who escapes with the GPS encoder. Typical Bond stuff, but also pretty underwhelming as far as the prologue goes. So a ship gets sabotaged on Chinese waters as we meet one of the film's villains, a lame off-brand Jean-Claude Van Damme named Mr. Stamper, who also shoots down a Chinese jet and kills the survivors of the downed ship, the HMS Devonshire. Stamper steals a missile from the ship, and then we meet Stamper's boss, a nerdy-looking media mogul named Elliot Carver, who owns the Carver Media Group Network. And what does Carver plan to do? Use the encoder stolen at the beginning of the film to pit China against the United Kingdom. So it's the Cold War all over again. We see James in bed with a woman who's not Natalia Simonova as he gets a ring from Miss Moneypenny. Admiral Roebuck, MI6's military contact, sends the British fleet to investigate the Devonshire after reading a report of the attack, leaving M 48 hours to investigate. With all due respect, Tim, sometimes I don't think you have the balls for this job. Perhaps. The advantage is I don't have to think with them all the time. Bond gets sent to Hamburg to investigate Carver when he runs into Q, who introduces Bond to probably one of the coolest vehicles in the series, and that's saying a lot. It's a remote-controlled BMW, and later in the film, it leaves an impression. Well, it's surprisingly difficult to drive, but uh, with practice... Mm -hmm. Well, let's see how she responds to my touch, eh, Q? Understand each other? <laughs> Grow up, 007. So Bond goes to meet Carver as he's about to make his worldwide announcement concerning his television network when he meets an old flame, Carver's wife, Paris, played by Terry Hatcher. Was it something I said? How about the words, I'll be right back? He gets ambushed by Carver's thugs, makes his daring escape, and shuts down Carver's broadcast in mid speech, making him look like an asshole in front of his wife and causing her to cheat on him. I hate when that happens. This job of yours. Uh, it's murder on relationships. Well, at least she acknowledges it's a sin. So thanks to Carver's cheating wife, Bond gets access to Carver's newspaper headquarters where he steals back the encoder during a shootout. Really? A shootout in the middle of a newspaper headquarters? Are they that bereft of ideas? Then Bond goes to meet up with Paris to confirm his success and finds her dead. In the meantime, Stamper and his men attempt to break into Bond's BMW, which as we know from prior Bond films, is never a good idea. Bond escapes his assassin and drives his car remotely, resulting in his film's standout action scene. It's a pretty simple action sequence, but satisfying as hell. Next, Bond rendezvous with CIA agent Jack Wade, reprising his role from Goldeneye, where he discovers how the encoder is able to offset the course of the ships at sea. He parachutes into the South China Sea to investigate the wreck of the Devonshire, where he meets fellow agent Colonel Wei Lin. Together, they get captured by Carter, who in typical Bond tradition, reveals all his plans involving world domination. As Carter goes off to execute his plan, John claude Van Dumbass attempts to kill James, when the two of them escape by crashing through Carter's window and doing a bit of John McClane. Come on, it's an obvious ripoff. Then there's a chase scene, which was later copied by the film Night and Day, where James and Wei Lin evade the bad guys as they're handcuffed to each other. They hop across the China rooftops while evading gunfire from a helicopter. Again, very typical Bond stuff. Hell, it's typical 90s action movie stuff. And then there's this scene, where all that's missing is John Williams' E.T. score. They interrupt some Chinese women in the middle of, I don't know, topless cooking? Well, you tell me. We don't see her lover in this shot. So after they cause the helicopter to explode, they shower in public, and just as James thinks he's getting some Chinese tang, Wei Lin cuffs him to the building and just leaves him there. She then engages in a karate fight on her own when Bond finds her and takes care of the last guy for her. After fucking him over in the alley, it's the least he could do. 
Flynn reveals that the warehouse is actually a top secret computer facility, which they used to pinpoint Carver's location. Boarding a ship that looks like it was stolen from the set of Mortal Kombat, they find Carver's stealth ship, where Lin somehow manages to get herself captured. Bond takes Gupta as hostage, but Carver shoots him because he was dispensable, and face it, no one cared about him anyway. There's an explosion, Lin and Bond regroup, there's a big drawn out shootout, Carver gets drilled, Bond and Vanilla Ice fight each other, there's another explosion, and Lin and Bond swim to safety. And they fuck. Well, it's implied. Short review for a decent sized Bond film, just under two hours. As you'd expect, it's just not as memorable as GoldenEye. GoldenEye pretty much revitalized the franchise, but now they were going back to that tired tradition of the villain who wants to take over the world. Aside from the remote-controlled car, which is a really cool action scene in itself, there aren't a whole lot of gadgets and the main villain is just boring. For God's sakes, Bill Gates is more threatening. Stack him next to Travel in or on its own. Hell, even Boris. He just doesn't make the grade of a great Bond villain. With that being said, I give this one credit. It's pretty entertaining. But I didn't leave this one with that saying, wow, he's back excitement. It was more of a, well, he's back, I guess. Seriously, there's nothing separating it from all the lethal weapons, Mission Impossibles, or Die Hard. Great action scenes, but I could give less than a shit about anything else. So for me, Tomorrow Never Dies is the middle of the road. Not as bland as the Dalton films, but on the same level as the last few Roger Moore installments. Like I said before, as much as I like Brosnan in the role, he doesn't grow a whole lot from film to film, so he doesn't add anything new here. It's a forgettable installment, but I can't deny that it's still a lot of fun in the way of your typical action flick. And that's what it is, a decent, watchable action flick. According to this...